have a very interesting session. The technical excellence that is all hot when not possible in all places. So I thank uh, the VRSI, my sir, and Jens for this uh, for having me to be part of this wonderful uh, session. And as we are we are always expecting we are all the top. All of us are with me. What do you feel in the So this will be a very interesting session and we will be seeing whether it was the beginning or the we did the challenge. So the first talk is by Dr. Sankir Mishra, 27 age in complex Thank you, Dr. Thank you, thank you Dr. Prakash and thank you VRSI for giving me the opportunity to present here. So this is not a related to the session, it's a different talk and it's sponsored by Alpha. So, 27 k to get me in complex scenarios. Uh, I'll be presenting for us two cases in which we have operated them in 27 k And uh, I'll give you some tips uh, and tricks to manage these complex cases uh, in 27 k So, why 27 k Because the cutter is smaller, the port is bigger and closer to the dick. So, it's got a fast cutting rate. Nowadays, we have 27 k cutters with 20,000 cuts. And the low, it's about the main important thing. It has got a very low flow rate. So as compared to 23 gauge, the flow rate at the tip of the cutter is this uh, one seventh of the what is in the 23 gauge. That uh, using all these properties, the detective cutter uh, can act as a <coughs> multiple instruments for cutting and removing, which is segmentation, anti lamination, cleaning of membranes, SRF drainage, air fluid exchange, dye injection, scissors, dark flush, even forceps. So you don't need. Uh, any other instrument and it saves time uh, in the process. So just uh, one of the advantages is it's, uh, the, it, uh, it's a single e easy entry. Uh, I'm just going, this is not what I routinely do, but just to demonstrate that how easy it is to make these incisions are going double both incisions, uh, making both the steroids together. So there are many cosmetic advantages to 27 gauge, uh, less trauma to the surface, increased wound stability, more post-operative comfort, Easier entry, less leakage, increase in transmission and hypopnea, and less chances of post op infection. But the main advantages are the surgical advantages which 27 gauge detective systems have. Uh, like small sphere of influence and small size of cutter, it's very helpful in PDR with extensive fractional detachments. Low flow rate in red <coughs> combined retinal detachments or in very mobile retinas. The membranes are easier to grasp and dissect, and for combined procedures, uh, because of the smaller pores, so they decrease post of hypotony and avoids use of air for sclerotomy closure. So just uh, just to demonstrate the low flow rate, you can see how close to the retina you can work with the cutter itself. Like I'm sharing the vitreous here, and just instead of keeping the port away from the retina, keeping the port towards the retina, and the retina is not not at all coming towards the port. So uh, the low flow rate is low flow that you can work very close to the retina. And using this pop property, you can use it in complex cases like this case of uh, trauma with the uterus hemorrhage and retinal detachment and uterus incarceration. So you can work very close to the retina. I'm doing a cautery around the uterus incarceration here. And doing a retinectomy, uh, which can be done with 27 gauge systems also easily around the incarceration site. And after completion of the retinectomy, we do a fluid air exchange using the cutter itself. You don't need a back pressure for that. And then do an endo laser, and silicon oil was injected in this case. So this is three months post-op, uh, one year post-op, the best corrective vision was 6 36 and the retina was attached. So this is two years, the patient is maintaining uh, the vision. So I have just discussed how the small sphere of influence comes into play. This is the patient with PTR with combined retinal detachment, 51 years female, best corrective vision was hand image only. And discuss the advantages side by side. So one, as I told you, the cutter is very small, it can go into crevices. Very small crevices. You can see here just in very small spaces between the two vascular nails. You can go with the cutter itself and then segment the membrane and remove the membrane very close to the retina. 
just with the cutter you can do all the dissection. The cutter in fact even goes between the membrane and the retina horizontally also you can properly delaminate using the cutter itself. And because as I told you it's, uh, the flow rate is very low, you can operate very close to the retina uh, fearlessly. So in this patient, we were able to complete the dissection with the cutter itself without the use of any scissors or forceps uh, and, and using the uni manual dissection only. So this is the post-operative. The patient uh, took a respiratory movement of 6 by 9 in this side after removal of 6 by 9. So in, in, in this case, the objection comes is that the forceps are not very strong, so you don't need a forceps, you can use the vitrectum as the pillar itself. So here it's an epiretinal membrane, which you see, I can feel with the cutter itself because the port is very close to the tip. So you just go between the membrane and the retina, just hold the membrane, just by creating a gentle suction and you can feel the membrane from the retina using the cutter itself without needing The handy tool is the traditional sclerotomy. Suppose you are somewhere you caught between that you need a larger port. You can make an additional sclerotomy. This is a 28 years male with trauma with intraocular fall body incarcerated in the retina. And, uh, and this fall body was released from the retina. There was additional sclerotomy was made. The fault body was lifted using active suction and shifted to the claw forceps and was removed through this sclerotomy. And this sclerotomy was later on sutured using a 6 0 micro suture. And this is post operative of the same patient, the vision improved to 6 by 6. And for nucleus drop, like hard nucleus, if you want to use the phaco fragmentum, again, this additional 20 gauge sclerotomy can dust, and this also can be done in a sutureless. So here I am using a 27 gauge cutter to, but the, 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 the nucleus was very hard, so making a beveled entry with a 20 gauge knife, then putting the plug here just to make a track and through this track you can easily Nicely with oil, it is not a gas, I think. Such a big capillary way and in mechanical gravity. So, primary methods, that was the oil. The primary surgery, I used the oil. I removed the oil and I did the surgery. One more suggestion is that I think that you could just use a buckle in the first reacting in the way you do the research. Is there a role of a buckle in doing it prior and then some? Nobody can just get up. It was almost in the posterior pole. Correct, correct. But then you are trying to reduce the intrinsic contraction. Yeah? Is there a role of a buckle? I am just asking you what would be affected the role of a you know, temporal buckle which would have got some amount of reduction of the sharp pain of the leg. So I did buckle longer. That's so a I just long and I it just give me a rubbing Very brave case, Dr. I do have a similar experience of the monocular body and I had diatomized the tropics of leader in tropicality and the most of the patient had a diatomacular body but luckily there was no subretinal fluid uh, as was seen in the office so I would uh, have to agree with Dr. Hayman who said that probably there was a pre-existing you know residual membrane or something which had caused the contraction otherwise the hole would have just made and would have tasted it. But the fact that subretinal fluid came means that there was some intrinsic retinal uh, you know, traction and probably I do agree that the diatomy would have exacerbated yes. the use uh, in the event of persistent traction. If there are no more questions, I think we will go to the next case. Thank you, Dr. Bharat. And um, the Herculean labor is retrieving the three white gems of Sony by Dr. Mahal.
I mean, I'm not really bending over backwards to enjoy just get it up to me and take it out dramatically. I would just go there and reject them and throw it out. I think that, that uh, doesn't cause any problem. Uh, trans, trans clearly, you can sometimes use a cryo and fold it because it will give you better kit and you can take it out if you are getting the hold on it. But if you try to use it with the process, with anything, you break it. Once it breaks, then you have to be very clear about the other things. So I think that I did ask the cryo. Just touch it, hold it and take it. And I just want to repeat that again. 20 years back, we realized you don't need to do that. More than 25 years back, in fact. That all you need to do is go inside and eat it up. <coughs> and just clean up the vitreous. Nothing will happen, no reaction will happen. If it's some retina, bring it out into the vitreous and eat it up. The, the key point is eat it up. You don't need to do all these maneuvers. Nothing is needed. The whole thing uh, goes away. There is no reaction at all, whatsoever. Show that there's one case which was handed where actually took it out into and there was no reaction. Nothing. Another problem that happens when you try to move in class clearly is like I remember a case that I was assisting Professor Gupta at that time and he tried to move it class clearly because at that time the techniques were not available. And uh, one is clear out me where this is migrated to another place. Second is clear out me where this is migrated to another place. So this migration of cysts is also quite a possibility while you are moving cars clearly. You may not actually catch hold of the system. I ask Dr. Chetan if you are ready for his presentation. Any other yeah, questions point? On the, from the floor? Practice talk. I have about uh, four, four case experience uh, in the world of uh, subretinal sectors and terminal systems. And uh, I have always reported uh, one part in this in Toto. Uh, unlike the concept of the Toto, I like to remove it in Toto for this is sheer pleasure of removing it in Toto. It's not. If you eat it up, then it's not much like that. So, and uh, when you do it, it runs literally, like, you know, localize it like a break uh, in an RD case and then you will cut down. Can it cut down? And it's a broad activity and a specific product from the uh, from some space, you just have to apply gentle pressure and nudge it out. If we come on its own, there's no need for any forceps or dry or anything. Just come on, you just wait for it to come on and come on. This is what I practice and it's about very much. Uh, and then you know when you take it out totally, you can show it to the patient's relatives and you can take credit that I did such a big job in doing that.
So I think it's better to use my money or technique. For, for <laughs> yeah. So I agree. I think that is a good point. Uh, uh, Biomedical technique is easier because you have better control over your uh, uh, the tissue. And retina is unnecessarily tearing because you're pulling. So uh, yeah, Biomedical technique will be much better. Yeah. Uh, amongst the panel, anyone has experience using chin ESS? Because uh, fragile retina sometimes, you know, with use of this, I've seen steam charts using it. And I, I asked him why, I said the uh, retina's consistency is a little stronger to avoid tearing. I mean, that's what steam is looking I think, if, uh, to my mind, if I don't see heart which is speaking, not which is sticking, I will presume there is a membrane near heart. If it's a pure clot, usually it moves out more easily. If, it, if the clot has an underlying membrane, it becomes more sticky, it doesn't come out easily. So the first thing that I would do when I see this, I would try my best to see characters of membrane off the surface. Because that means I'm not in the right plane. And if in that situation I collect the membrane, I actually end up with Subedu's situation. So I don't want to do that. So first thing is, of course, that in this situation, and I, the, the, the instrument which is the finest for picking up a very fine membrane of the rectal surface, what I found is a 25 gauge MBR. The not the blunt one, but the sharp one. You just tease it onto the rectal surface and you'll find the membrane will come off. So if you do it in the area or the vicinity of that blood, you'll be able to pick out the plane. Once you pick out the plane, it'll be easier to pick up. If you still have a problem, the second step is to use PFCL. Under PFCL, you have a second hand working for you. And the last question is when you use a bimanual. If nothing else works, then the bimanual is being perfected. And the last thing, if still is not happening, before you create a break, do an airflow exchange, put in silicone oil, it, the blood will liquefy over the next few days, go in again after a few days. You'll find it easier to do a second surgery, you live to fight another day. Otherwise, you would have created more problems. You're lucky that you've still got vision. Sometimes you may not get that. Yeah, but going back to the first point, like uh, what you said, 25 days. So I use a lot of these 25 days for that particular reason. And again, I won't be happy if I have a hand and membrane and such a large break at the post shift hole. And then waiting for the blood to release and be able to clear it. So that will be most easy after So, so, so start with the first step. Yeah, so the first step is The first step is with the MPR. Yeah. And to see if you can ease it off. If you can't ease it off, then the second step is to do the same under PFCL. Using a diamond dusted to push the, uh, the, the blood. And then using the combination of the diamond dusted and the 25 gauge. If that doesn't work, use bimanual. If it still doesn't work, don't try to create breaks, put it in the sleep. But that, I'm sure you'll agree that in cases where the retina is so disorganized and you have all these things, the retina is so disorganized, so thin in the skin, it's actually very brittle. You try any of these traction, any of these procedures to uh, remove the surface uh, clots or membranes, yeah. it ends up creating more damage than yes. anything. And these are the kind of detachments which always have this very fine membrane. Yeah. So if you don't remove that first, if you don't get that plane first, when the bleed occurs, you get stuck. What to speak to the panel, what would be the idea instrument to pick up that red clot? Happy picking it up with the force up from all the edges to the center and then putting it in the So okay, the best uh, way to manage blood clot in this epipedal syndrome is to debulk rather than trying to remove it wholly. Debulk it and it the back not try to pull it and all the break. That is the secret of keeping these uh, uh, clots till, till the time when the second surgery can be done. Not long after, like uh, I would say, uh, or organized different type of membrane. Doctor Nish said, membrane, but I believe it says organized different. The membrane that forms immediately after the brain starts is much thicker and stronger than the membrane that later on develops on top of it. And that is something that you can table, you can backlash, you can sort of reduce it in size. But uh, I don't think it's a membrane all the time. Usually, such a thing that would not respond to a backlash or this thing and the rest of the way, so my mind is still the same. The play between vacuum only and the play between the 
but there is a generic trend that people are not giving as much as the stock So I think this is one of the reasons why we have this way of talking. I want to, before that, uh, Dr. Ritesh can be ready for the next talk. I want to ask the panel, how much importance do you give to the, it is a nightmare for all of us, so how much importance do you give to the very operative before surgery control is like looking at the bleeding factor, because we see many renal disease patients have prolonged FTTD, so do you address that one thing, because we have a protocol where FTTD is prolonged, if it's mildly prolonged, we give some intra, uh, intra and the or we use tranexamic acid, or if it is very much prolonged, we tend to give a fresh cough, fresh FFP one hour before the surgery. Um, we feel it actually controlled so much. But again, one more important thing is intraoperative. The NIV, we monitor NIV, we control it. So many times we see in the ward the baby was only 130 to 80, but by the time the patient reaches the table, the baby is 180 to 110. So many times it goes unnoticed. So we monitor NIV, we control NIV. So we found intra venous level stop. It's quite good to control the baby intraoperative. So do you all follow this one? Patients who are on aspirin, patients who are on dialysis, and I routinely do CBC for all my patients of diabetes because in the past I have had at least three or four cases with myeloprotective disorders who had CML because with age CML also can be there and can be associated with this disease because of which they can be treating. So in an unsus unsuspecting uh, situation, I think we can rule out by simple test of CBC. Such conditions have avoided these conditions. Systemic control, including the underlying CML or any other myoprolific disease, is something that we can take note. What is your question? Yeah, I'm in. Once the bleeding has stopped, 
you have laid up the uh, all the loose uh, heel and the blood clot is there. Now you want to switch back to throw it. If the bleeding has to start again, put in a little BFC in. Go back, identify the bleeder, and then remove the BFC. Is there a switch to air and back to fluid? Yes, yes, yes. So this works very good for these bleeding I stained the retina 
I did two inverted flaps, one covering that particular tear uh, and another covering the anterior bone. And left the blood clot practically undisturbed, let the coagulum there to kind of plug up it because I didn't was not able to do laser in that area. Did an inverted flap to both the areas. Luckily for me, uh, the whole was the patient, two weeks was 618 and two months is 612. There is a scar in the area of the brain where you can see the hole is closed. I got to give it that. So, thank you. So, my question here for the panelists is twofold. The first case, uh, the technique and the disease contributed, I think, both in that case. Second one was definitely not the disease contributing at all, it was merely an error of judgment. Hyperflexibility in the outer retinal layers 
as the matter, which was not there in the pre operatory. We did a fungus water fluorescence, which showed a stippled area of hyper and high water fluorescence at the mantra at the site of healing. Three months post operatively, the patient's visual activity was 6 12 and near vision was ended. However, the outer retinal fiber of the activity remained, and the fungus out water fluorescence showed marginal interferon. Six months post operatively, the visual activity was stable, the outer retinal fiber activity remained the same, and the fungus out water fluorescence also remained nearly the same. So, this is how the pre operative uh, photo was. The outer retinal layers were normal. However, post-operatively, there was hyperflectivity in the outer retinal layers, which never got better, at least at six months post -operative. And this is the fungus of persons, which maybe marginally showed some increase in the hyperflectivity of persons area at six months post operative This is the second case of a 62-year-old male who presented with the metamorphopsia. Uh, he was a known case of old supratemporal BRBO and had received multiple anti-regional injections in the last few six months back. Now he presented with the visual activity of 636 and near vision n 12 on examination, he had an epidemic memory and in decentral macular thickness and uh, the outer end is again we see or not there. Uh, the patient underwent uh, left eye phacomarbital calcification with 25 gh PPV with ERM and IRM PA and 20 percent SF6 gas tamponade was given. One month post operatively, the vision had dropped down to 660, there was no metamorphopsia and the fundus again showed RP, not in temporal xenophobia. You can see some changes in the outer retina and when you got a lot of fluorescence now, there was a dense uh, hyper fluorescence temporal xenophobia in the area of PA. Two months post operatively, <coughs> the patient's visual activity had improved slightly of 636 near vision NAT and the fundus auto fluorescence and the uh, OCT remained the same. You can see the uh, hyper, uh, sorry, hyper activity in the outer retina less and slight disruption of the ERP uh, and uh, certain cases. Uh, four months post operatively, the picture was again the same. This is the multicolor photo showing the ch pigmentary changes of the macula. And six months again, the uh, patient had a similar. Look. <coughs> this is the uh, uh, consecutive OCD. This is pre operatively, there was no changes in the uh, infrared image also, and uh, later the, the changes were left uh, post operatively. So, chromatectomy as we all know has success great, uh, has improved the success rates of macular surgeries. However, there are certain complications with membrane feelings, which include visual field effects, retinal tears, and RP alterations. The person is called as well as And so, there are multiple case reports of macular toxicity following the BVG uh, uh, and and online. However, there are very limited, and the uh, fungus photo and the autoclorosis, the OCD and autoclorosis are quite similar to our case. However, there are very limited case reports following the uh, epidermal membrane feelings. This is one case report by Vidra et al. They showed similar outer retinal changes and auto process changes in the post operative period with no improvement in vision. And another case report by Vendikesh et al. again showed the, uh, a stippled hyper auto process in the area of peeling and similar outer retinal changes. In our case, we used BVG dye at 0.05% in the first case, striking to 0.15% in the second. The contact time is 2.5 minutes in the first and 2 minutes in the second. It's stained under the fluid in the first case and under air in the second. 60% elimination was used in both the cases and the total surgical time was 15 minutes. So to conclude, even though ER and the ER and the total surgery, there is no direct exposure of the RT to the DG dye and light energy in the right, there is a possible chance of photo and dye toxicity in these cases. So we need to be quick and precise by performing these manual surgeries, avoid repeated RT staining with DG under air, definitely less than one minute, and avoid using high potentially total elimination close to the mantle. I would like to thank Dr. Dinesh Dabar for the uh, contribution and responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well documented. Okay, look, clearly there was an outer layer damage induced by the surgery, which was very evident. In the so my question to the panel is, do you believe the diet would have uh, been integrated? It's not a matter of whole surgery and RP is far away, covered by the sensory retina. So do you think the diet would have actually caused this damage? Uh, so it's a brilliant to diet which is used. And I think uh, all of us are using it for many years and unlike ICG based uh, reports in the past, we don't see this kind of thing for the diet. So I'm not sure if we can in the diet. The only thing is that important is the diet taken post diet injection at the amount of light. Now, how, much, how many minutes is that intense light being focused on that area? I suppose that is 10, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, that is more important for phototoxicity than just the presence of the diet alone. Uh, a typical Pain actually takes one or two or three minutes. But suppose it's there for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, one doesn't know how uh, 
combination of the diet or the light food is spot. So the time would be more crucial than just the diet or diet. I think there are three components in this uh, so for toxicity. One is the chromotoxicity, uh, uh, toxicity due to the light cell. Second is the phototoxicity, right? It's not light used. The third is the surgical trauma itself. The surgical trauma, especially if it is done by a novice or those taking too much time to keep the memory. I think these are the three factors which determine how the OCD will look like after the surgery. I think uh, it's very difficult to quantify which one is predominant. So if you usually appear in local based pockets, uh, do not be like a diffuse area taking the shape of the tree or uh, so that's why uh, I'm thinking more of the time of intensity in that area which has had the time uh, with total toxicity rather than trauma. That's the reason why I think. Actually, a paper which shows that the, the more vegetal hemorrhages on the macula, we should look away from the other. So, I think the effect of what we induce is many times under, we are not recognizing. It could be a loss for us. That's it. As Dr. Gurukhrishnan mentioned, I think phototoxicity is something which we have to be really aware of in this situation. I think uh, what the caution is that don't only for xenon light and I think even we, we were thinking of uh, an LED source as a cold light but even a strong LED source we found that if you <coughs> use it at full intensity illumination we found that the fiber was getting kind of damaged or worked off in one in the case or even during one case by the illumination and then we found that if you reduce the intensity to 50 or 60 percent the, the fiber light increased and we simultaneously found at that time that we were getting phototoxicity in uh, macular root surgery. So possibly that was what was causing the, the phototoxicity and the RPA changes. So I think we have to be very careful as uh, Dr. Prashad and Manish also mentioned that we uh, ex see that the exposure to the light within the INM peeling, whether it's macular hole or INM peeling is not there. Even after you've done the ILM cleaning, because the rest of the steps when you're closing the case and all, try to see that you keep your light intensity to the minimum required for the case. Thank you, sir. Can I ask Dr. Motukrishnan? So, uh, thank you, Dr. Nita, for that wonderful presentation. Next. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Sir, please come. I have time. Sir, just go back Why is Why is such a long exposure time? Only 20 seconds under fluid is good enough to stay in the ERM or the ILM, a negative stating for the ERM and a positive stating for the ILM. I was just wondering. And uh, what the other point I was saying was the same for Dr. Silas, I said. That brings one more question. Uh, would you prefer, see, whenever you do under air, there is always a, the diet being very concentrated on the retina compared to the fluid. Yes. So I have never experienced with diet. I think most of the past when different diet was there, you know, we used to avoid participating diet or we worried about the fitness of the others to stay in the state capsule and that's why I think of that. But uh, I always uh, stay in the fluid. And what I do, I use contact with my feet for uh, the earlier part of the cell. So with that, after I clear the PVD, I inject the diet. And then I can just take the time to switch the legs to a flat legs. I feel legs to flat legs and go back and take away the excess. I have to do some of the skin. It still takes 15, 20 seconds. This all, you don't explain to me longer in this time. It's called a little bit of a thrill. It's very fun. I agree with uh, Manish. I, mean, I don't think we are playing under air uh, once we started using the brilliant blue. In the tripan blue era, we used it under air. The only situation where I would use it under air and with brilliant blue is a high myopic eye where the, uh, the island doesn't stain very well and there's a lack of contrast. We want to really stain it well. 
That's the only situation where I would stay under air even in a brilliant pool. Otherwise, in a macular bowl and a VR facility or that, they could have to be just staying under the fluid for maximum 20 to 30 seconds should be good enough. In those cases, there is this thought that you will die which takes much better in case uh, for those high mounted guys, useful for those cases, for the last one, the last one.
observed that surgical removal of CNM is the most stabilizing patient in selected cases of small non scarred classic CNM. Our series demonstrates role of submantial assembly for large fibrotic CNM of more than 3 disc diameters in improving or stabilizing visual acuity. Von Roman advocates full macular classification and RP transplantation is still in the infant stage. Limitation of retrospective study, small sample size, and short duration of follow up. The take home message fibrotic CNM is not available to conventional treatment modalities. Prognostic factors are the underlying disease process, growth pattern, and the patient's age. Submantial surgery may have a role in stabilizing deteriorating vision in selected cases with refractory manual. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I'd like the opinion of the panel on this. So one question I always get, many of the time these are like these games are so hard, they don't come with the cutter, so we will back them. I'm still not at least comfortable with the system, but it's just not there. But what for scarred membranes? Today I'm going to do it for these large sub-actual membranes, where they go and observe it's a medium size. Or start it up when we go to the usual technology and remove it. But uh, I don't think I have the to start the brain, so uh, I'm not sure how to interpret that. Right? It's a start, it's okay. At times it's actually in the body, it's in the It's just under the house. If you're taking this thing away, then it's fast. But you can't get done, right? You have to get it back. You can 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 get it back. Muthu, uh, your, your cases all had 14 of them, 12 of them had hemorrhage. Which was breakthrough hemorrhage? Which was hemorrhage, yes. Breakthrough which is hemorrhage. A breakthrough which is hemorrhage. So you get the vitrectomy and on the table you found this hemorrhage. Uh, on the table, and yes. decided to do it. Yes. And of course, the patient has a breakthrough hemorrhage, the patient is very poor. And post-operatively, the patient has a very poor. I mean, I wonder whether the should not have that been different. If you had just done the vitrectomy and come out. You know, and that's my thought. Because I think subacular surgery has been around for such a long time, but I don't think that we are, we are doing it so much because the results are not really that clear. So in your case, series of cases, you had reduced hemorrhage causing the decreased vision. And then you removed the reduced hemorrhage, you also did the subacular surgery. Suppose we had not done it and just removed the reduced hemorrhage, would the visual results have been similar? Is that what, what crosses my mind? We do not know that. Yes. This was not only for large fibrotic so more than three is the size. Those are important. So how much is anti-major pain problem and we close? We'll put up to the because calcification of fibrosis, the whole RP provide complex is all becomes one. When you remove the uh, calcific pigment, basically the whole RP, even the surrounding is they are doing the graph the graph. Thank you. With that, thank you for the discussion. And with that, we come to the end of the session. Thank you, sir. And just summarize the take-home messages that we have learned from this. First, we had the principal vitrectomy converting by the opponents. Back to the street and then remove the red cloud very safe. Also, the message of air temporarily and our screening also has been removed. And it draws red cloud and we will just have a manuscript as a mode of discussion. And the clinical research was not the case where we had a quite feeling extensive diagram outside the arcade. You had an actual mode, actually, actual mode. So, whenever you are doing this, there is not a telephone perception problem. The retina will appear very flat and you forget that it is a three dimensional structure, the concave structure, and where you are moving outside the angle, you might touch the retina and cause that for any problem. So, this is a special tool where you are using eye magnification as well as contact lens. Then we had a free paper that clearly documented archetoxicity during an archi damage during ER and surgery. Could be phototoxicity for everybody, especially beginners who talk. And if this issue reduce the time of light exposure, don't go too close with the light wave to the actra when doing surgery. And also surgical trauma during such a VR removal of the face and uh, underrated problem which can happen. And also staining under air can be avoided staining under the place itself if you put some amount of staining in the face and BPG and you can reduce the surgical time, exposure time as well as it can reduce the depth and the light of the So with that
that, we come to the end of this session. Thank you all. Thank you all the very sponsors for having us. Make the session very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Requesting all panelists, moderators, speakers, presentable for the photo. <laughs>